First of all, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Kathy. You know, we did come together. Gosh, it's been about two months, and we're going through the whole throes of kind of merging our two firms together and looking for those types of synergies. And I know many of you have been through that kind of drill many times. I've known Kathy for about three and a half years, and uh, I think we got the better end of the stick, quite honestly. We really did. She's a delightful person, wonderful partner, and we're just glad, glad to be here in Chicago with TTG. And in many ways, I feel like we're coming home. Um, I actually used to live in southwest Michigan over in Benton Harbor, St. Joe area. I worked with Whirlpool Corporation over there for years. Uh, we used to go to Saugatuck, Holland, you know, um, all the different parts of the state up to Mackin Island. And obviously we really felt like we were part of the metro Chicago. We got Chicago radio, Chicago TV. So, you know, became a White Sox fan. Sorry, Cubs fans, but, you know. <laughs> and, and that's a dangerous one for me, too, because my wife, Mary Ann, Oh, Mary Ann Pena is my wife too, so I, I just want to be full disclosure. <laughs> and we are partners with Kathy on this. Uh, is a Cubs fan, so it, it's weird that. It's so, <laughs> and of course, we do. Uh, having said that, we do live in the Dallas area now, and so I'm a, I'm a Rangers fan too. So we don't know what to do when they all play each other. Uh, and we also have an office in Atlanta. We also have a satellite office in Fort Worth, New Orleans, and Charlotte, North Carolina. So that's kind of our direct footprint. Having said that, we have OI Global Partners, or a partner group across the nation and the globe. In fact, we were just meeting last week in Miami. So we are able to deliver and support uh, across the globe, really. And we actually do that with a lot of our clients. So great to be here, love to be here, love to be with this group. My goal really is to just share a couple of nuggets with you. you know, And it might be different nuggets for all of you as you go through this whole thing called careers. And we all have our career story. Uh, I mean, my career story was, it took me a long time, probably half my life, to figure out what I actually wanted to do when I grow up. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes that's still evolving, I'm still figuring it out. And the best way I learned to figure it out was to write about it, right? So I remember actually when I was in Michigan over here is when we write the, wrote the first book called Make It Work. And did pretty well. Um, and and uh, since then, we've really tried to contribute and research and think about this whole career space. So uh, we're going to spend just a few minutes talking about, or a little time today, talking about your career from the inside out. Now, you do hear me say out. I'm sorry about that. I, I actually am Canadian originally, so, you know, <laughs> there's the out and about and A. Yet, I've lived in Texas 20 years, you know, collectively. Uh, so I think I'm the only guy in the world that says, how y'all doing, eh? I think that's... <laughs> That's pretty much, I'm the guy, right? A um, little bit of, about, I'm trying to say it right, about us, right? We, uh, we support the full talent life cycle, right? So we have three practice areas. The talent acquisition area. So I see we have a competitor back here on the corner here, recruiting, right? Executive search guy. Lots of, lots of room for us to both be successful. But the, uh, we do executive search. We do retain search. We've been doing that for a long time. Um, which is interesting and we really believe about getting the talent right so if you don't give us your search give us your assessment we're gonna help go out and make sure that we assess candidates and avoid those bad hires and make sure that we get great fit so we really believe in fit and that's the talent fit solutions piece on the other side we have career transformation solutions an area among other things that Kathy and the TTG and us have come together with really deep multi-decade experience which is helping people in career transition uh, and wherever they came from, what are they doing? That, that space is really transformed. And in the middle, we do a lot of talent development solutions. So this puts us in an interesting position because on either side, we are uh, working with companies to hire people every day in the market as an executive search firm. On the other side, we're helping companies effectively transition out people every day, all the time, in the market. So we're on both sides of that equation. And it's interesting because as we've been looking at this, it's really given us, I think, an interesting vantage point on executive transition. Because we work with, at any given time, hundreds of executives on their transition. We actually sponsor a group somewhat like this called DHRE in Dallas. And, and looking at this, we found that executive transition and how executives are creating roles has really changed over time. Now, I think I might be speaking to the choir because even as I talk to a few of you, it sounds like a lot of you know a lot of what I'm going to share on this slide in that the world of work has changed, right? And what we found time and time again is that executives don't necessarily want to go to that next corporate gig. Some do, some don't. It used to be that was the default, you know? 15 years ago, I need to get what I just had, 
I need to go into that VP role, that SVP role, that senior director. I need to go into that next, and it's got to have sim a similar title or a better title than I had before, and it's got to be in finance, it's got to be in a company with all the other accoutrements that come with a full-time job. That is what we constantly heard people were looking for. More and more what we found is that people aren't necessarily, more and more people aren't necessarily interested in a next corporate gig, right? They want to at least explore other alternatives. And here's some of the things that we've seen that people want to explore, and what we've also seen are more available out there. One is a lot more fractional leadership roles. Have any of you been in a fractional leadership role, CFO or otherwise? A couple of you, okay. More and more we're seeing that, uh, where uh, a lot of the startup, obviously, smaller company, they want the executive talent, but they can't afford it, so let's get you two days a week. Uh, a lot of our executive folks in transition are moving into these kind of fractional roles, and they stitch together two or three of these, or one with other consulting, but we see a lot more of that. Next, we see purposeful career pauses. I didn't see this much before. Now, I say purposeful career pause. If you have a career pause where you did nothing, that's really tough to explain two years later when you're back in the market. But more and more, we people, see people taking mission trips, taking time out to try something, to learn a language, to go study abroad, to whatever. We see these interesting purposeful kind of career pauses that, if anything, have enhanced in some potential employers that candidate as they really step back, learn a skill, and come back into the market. So we found that that's something we see more and more of, too. Next, rent-to-own contract assignments, right? Uh, almost all of us, a lot of times people want to jump into that full-time role, but more and more we see executives, hey, let's do a three-month assignment, let's work you a project, let's do something here, get to know each other first. Uh, and if you've ever had a bad hire, you know that it's good to get to know each other, both the employer and employee, before you actually dive into a full-time group. We see more and more of that going on. And I'd say from the, just the executive roles that we've helped some uh, our well placement folks transition to in the last three months, about half of them are these very senior, I mean SVP type level contract roles where they're coming in for an interim assignment. So we see that more and more. Virtual roles in global reach. Uh, we're working with one company, ScanTech. ScanTech is an emerging technology, uh, very interesting set of technologies. And they have a global team sitting Europe, United States, and down in South Texas, and they don't have a head office, right? I, we have another one, $150 million oil and gas services company, where they don't have a head office, right? So their CFO sits out in uh, Silicon Valley, their CEO's in Houston, they have four or five other folks distributed across the nation and one in Canada. They, we definitely see more and more of this where we can operate and integrate and align without having to co-locate both the expense and also the challenges of getting people to all want to live in the same place. More and more we're seeing this. Melding family and business. We see this too. Uh, I, I don't know how many, I never used to hear this. Maybe you used to hear it in Chicago. I'm hearing it more in Dallas and certainly some of our other markets. People will not take jobs because of the commute or they're not going to actually, they, they want a role where they can, you know, bring in the family, connect with the family in the actual business itself. Just a trend we're seeing. A lot more entrepreneurial consulting franchise startup. We're seeing consulting opportunistic and niche and fun, fundamentally pro-retirement. Nobody wants to retire anymore, it seems like. They all want to keep a toe in it. They all want to kind of keep, stay in the game to some level or not. So why do I share all this? Just because I think the world of work is offering a lot more options. And as we navigate this ambiguity, as we are in career transition, it can both be a good thing or a really stressful thing, right? Stressful in that, hey, it's not real clear the template of where I should go forward with my career. But having said that, if you can open up, and I would say stay open and explore. There are a lot more options as far as how you can make it work for you. So just something we're seeing out in the market. Let's jump in then. Um, we've got a, a book, kind of a recent book, called Don't Dread Monday. And Don't Dread Monday is, I think as the title says, uh, really about how do we make sure that we don't hate our job, right? That we're excited to get up, and that's really the litmus test, excited to get up and get to work every morning on Monday mornings. What we've, we actually did a lot of research is we continue to research this space and we found that there's this whole condition called Sunday night blues. Have any of you had Sunday night blues? Um, you know, it's funny because when I was a kid I used to watch Disney Sunday night. We had three channels, right? We'd watch Disney. 
And then, uh, and so I always associated that with Sunday night and Monday morning. And I remember when I didn't like my job really in my career, I heard Disney and all of a sudden I had this dreadful feeling. And I realized it was like Pavlov's dog. I associated the, this Disney music with, oh no, I gotta go to work the next day, right? Sunday night blues is real. Um, they've actually done some pretty interesting research on this. That there's, a, there's over half of us have experienced some level of Sunday night blues or do experience some level of Sunday night blues where we dread or at least don't, are not excited about rolling into work the next day. And so our passion is to help people build great careers. And what we see is that there's a real connection between people building great careers and companies having a higher level of engagement. So it really is, how do we get that discretionary effort? How do we help people build that career in a way that, that align with the company needs and expectations? Now, what we found is this. Fundamentally, building a great career doesn't start with the tactics. Doesn't start with me trying to figure out how do I get that next title, that more money, et cetera, et cetera. Those are nice things, but that's not where a great career that makes sure that you don't dread money starts. It starts really fundamentally with knowing yourself. Thus the title of this kind of deck, which is your career from the inside out, right? It starts with knowing yourself. And I'm gonna state some pretty obvious things. Why is it important to know yourself? Because avoid, to avoid obviously the unfulfilling jobs that really derail you and make you not wanna go in on Monday. And to have confidence, to know how much you can handle, and that's not a small one. In our assessment business, we found that, and as we do coaching, there's a big portion of our coaching that really does help people that have overstressed, that have gone beyond the threshold. They don't know how much they can handle. They don't know where their trigger points are. They've, they've lost it in the workplace or with their family or other important stakeholders in life. This is not a small one too. And know your value in the workplace. So these are a couple quotes that I really like, which is the wisest people know their own direction. And man stands in his own shadow, wonders why it's dark. You've got to know yourself at a deeper level. And what we're gonna walk through here in the next few minutes is a key level of insights that you may or may not have about yourself. But if you do have yourself, or at least have one or two ahas, it helps you then craft that career that's more aligned with who you are so to make sure that you don't dread Monday when you go in. All right, so in front of you, or at least in the side of your table, you have these one pagers, all right? Uh, and it's not the evaluation form for, uh, for our deal here today. But if you could make sure that everyone has one of these in front of you, and is 25 questions, right? And it's at the top of it, it's a career success indicator. Now, many of you are in a role right now, many of you are in transition. Um, if you're in transition, if you could fill this out uh, in behalf of your last role, and whatever, if you are in a role, then fill it out in terms of your current role. And this is just go with your gut. 25 questions, zero through two, which statement is mostly true of you? If you could just fill, just roll that up. Circle this number, again, gut response, and then add it up at the bottom, all right? Should only take you a couple minutes. All right, so let's, let's talk about this. Uh, I, I thought I'd give this a little assessment. A uh, couple reasons it gets you that self-insight. And then we can kind of build from this for the next few minutes. But also because we're a bunch of numbers people in here. So I figured you'd probably like the numbers. And we're going to talk about the numbers here in a sec. As you might have already guessed, uh, the higher the number, the better as far as your level of alignment and engagement in your current career. And you'll see that the questions themselves uh, really talk about a lot of things, like how well you're feeling physically. How, how emotionally how you, how you are as far as getting out of bed in the morning, etc. These questions were really refined through our research over the years as being the biggest predictors of career engagement and levels of satisfaction. And so these simple questions really are a nice indicator of where you're at or have been as far as uh, any kind of role that you're in. So just simple guidelines as far as interpreting your score, right? If you're between zero and 20, you're feeling the effects of a job that is mostly to totally misalign with your passions. And a job that probably isn't or wasn't really working for you very well. If you're 21 to 40, you're experiencing some ups and some downs, indicating that there's some aspects of the role that are working and other aspects that weren't totally aligned. And if you're 41 to 50, you're very fortunate because you're in a role that really is working for you. 
where your passions, your needs, they're actually being expressed and finding expression in your role almost every day. All right? Now, this is an interesting one, right? We've administered this to thousands of people. So we have a pretty good sample uh, from a distribution standpoint, right? So let me ask, how many, how many, what percentage of folks in our database do you think are 41 to 50? 10%? Who said that? That's smart. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else venture a guess? 5%. 5 5%? Five. Okay. All right. Let me show you the numbers. This is our database, right? So what we found is 9% are 41 to 50. 9% are in a role that they find really engaging, that is really working for them uh, at that moment in time. 59% are in the middle somewhere. And it's a broad middle, I understand that. But we find that there's enough variability that we, for us statistically to make sense, given our scale and stuff, that 59% were in that kind of meaty million. 32% were on the left side, 20 or lower. Where they really, really dreaded going to work on Monday. Now, we can break it out, but this was largely a professional group at multiple levels in largely Fortune 1000 companies, but you know, more broadly speaking. But that's generally the zeitgeist of what this population sample was. Now what was really discerning, I guess, was that 9% was transient, right? So 9% were not static there. So if you, if you measure today, May 3rd, and you're up in 41 to 50, wherever, whatever audience we're talking to, and we measured again, say, January 3rd of early next year, a lot of them aren't there anymore. So you might find yourself 41 to 50, but new role, new boss, new situation, whatever it is, I find myself now somewhere around 33, 21. So that 9% is not static, yes? So what, what level of uh, positions are there? Great question. You know, these, these are, these, there's, it's funny because we actually have broken out by executives before. This is a general population, largely professionals in Fortune 1000 companies. When I look at the executive distribution, it's slightly more rightly skewed. It's about 11%, but it's roughly the same distribution. Yeah. It's very interesting, actually. And what we, I found with the executive look and executives VP and above, is that the, the outliers are much more pronounced. Instead of 59% in the middle, it's either like 11% up here and is about 40% down here in a smaller middle. So either you love it or you hate it kind of thing, which was interesting in the executive breakout. Does that change at all uh, based on the functional area? You know, I mean, because you, you hear like finances we're there to serve, we want to serve, sometimes we're not brought up into the, mm -hmm. the upper echelons and so you can get the feeling that, you know, I'm just not appreciated. So, okay. That's a good question. I haven't broken it out by every function. We did this with IT and we find IT was very low. So the, uh, IT professionals, which is funny because the CIO role in our experience, and I actually want to go find some data, I see some data that supported this. Anecdotally, we found the CIO role has the highest turnover of any C-suite position. Uh, on average, right, we're talking averages, not specifics. And that IT departments on average have the lowest engagement scores when you do engagement surveys. Now again, that's on average, there's definitely variance from that, and some companies that's not true at all. Um, haven't broken it out by finance professionals, but that's a good idea, and we will do some more functional swaths on this. I think it's really helpful though. It's an interesting indicator of the health of your industry, health of your company, health of your, you as an individual, health of your function, and even the levels. Um, but I, nonetheless, the trends are pretty much, however we slice it, are roughly the same, right? Now this is this, it's interesting data for me because fundamentally, and again, well, and just to go back to this, so what we did in the research, it started with Make It Work, sitting over here in uh, St. Joe's of Michigan. And then the other books and articles since then is what we wanted to find out is that 3%, okay? So there's 3% of folks fundamentally we found that stay up here in 41 to 50 and don't move. The 6% that are added on, they move in and out. But there's 3% roughly of folks that love their job year in, year out, and love what they do. 97% of the rest of us have some level of disengagement, unhappiness, to great unhappiness with our role and our, and our career. So we wanted to study that 3%. What does that 3% do? So anyway, through our research, this is some of the things that we learned, and some of this is probably pretty self-evident. One is, 
career. It's where the biggest part of our productive lives are spent, right? And it's used to define who we are. Certainly here in the Western cultures, if I circulate in a room, you know, even in a, a non-work setting, who are you? I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, you know, I run a business, I have an IT company, whatever it is. It defines who we are. I mean, I told you what I do. I didn't tell you that I have five kids, right? Often that's somewhere ba over here. That should define me more than it does. Actually, I want to avoid, that. It's, it's, that's why I'll work the rest of my life, because we've got five kids. <laughs> that's why I'll be doing this for, for forever. But a uh, huge impact and overall sense of well-being, and it impacts everything. What we learn in our research is that careers really matter. It's not just within those walls and times that we spent on the job, it affects our health, our sense of well-being, our identity, the energy we bring into the rest parts of our life. So fundamentally, most people are in the midst of a mediocre career. And the few who have sustained engagement are dedicated to doing what they love. I know it sounds really trite to say that, but it's absolutely true. And it's funny, because you even hear, listen to people who are interviewed who've had a great deal of success, and they almost always say, I love what I do, and we almost like move beyond that, like it's trite, it's silly, so what? But they really do. They're dedicated and focused on what they do. Now, the thing about doing what you love is that you gotta know what you love and what you need, and that's what we're gonna spend a little exercise on here in a minute. All right, so why are people uh, experiencing mediocre careers? I think there's two reasons. One is, pervasive career myths. A lot of the career advice we've been given is not right. It's toxic, even. A little bit. A lot of it's true, but not of it. a lot of it is. That's what our research says. And then two, misalignment with our passions. Most of us find employment in organizations, and those organizations are not in the business of asking us what we love, and what we want to do. So we've got to own it ourselves and not be a slave to an organization in a sense. We've got to really own and do what our love we love and, and, and align with our passions. All right, so what we've found in our research is that there's 16 pervasive career myths. Um, and it's important to get the belief system right, right? That it goes into career success. And so we study those 3% and then the 97% of the rest of us. We found that there's 16 career, pervasive career myths. I'm not gonna go through each one of these. But know that there are kind of a career truths associated with each one, and we talk about them in Don't Dread Monday. But I do want to highlight a couple of career myths and truths that I think are helpful. One is, to get ahead, you just need to do a good job. Now, it's funny, we work with executives every day, right? We help them find jobs, we help them on the career transition out, and a lot of them know this, but a lot of us still don't. It's absolutely critical to do a great job. Absolutely. I don't want to ever say it isn't. But it's necessary, but not sufficient. Because fundamentally, organizations are comprised of individuals. Individuals are innately non-rational, emotional, and everything else. So politics are inevitable. And, I, and when we do our coaching work, so much of it is how do you read, and adjust, and influence people, right? It's not just enough to stay in your silo and do a great job, finance or otherwise. You have to influence, you have to manage through and with other people. Politics, whatever you want to call it, are inevitable. The real question is how do you navigate the politics without becoming a political animal? Next is, it's important to have work-life balance. Now, let me explain this one, right? Uh, I love, I don't want to like be all about work. I got five kids, like I already said, and I like to see them and spend a lot of time with them. But I think some of the crusty, archaic definitions of work-life balance have really done a lot of disservice to people, as if, working a certain number of hours, see 45, and then going on and having your life. As if work and life are two different things. And what we found is for that 3%, work and life are not two different things. Work and life are interconnected and they're really, really important. So what they found in studying that 3%, it's not about work-life balance, it's about finding your life's work. And then you have more energy for everything else. And for you to just say, well, I gotta work and then go live and no, find your life's work and you have more energy, more health, more exuberance for every other aspect of your life. And then, of course, manage your life so that all the important things are taken care of, community, family, etc. The company will take care of you. I think a lot of us know that's not true anymore, right? It's funny, I, when, I, when I first left my first job, I was a relatively young professional, and my father, who was living at the time, I told him, well, I'm going to go find another job. He said, why would you ever, I mean, 
his, his template, like so many, right, was you stay at the company, after 30 years they give you that watch, they, give you, they throw you a little lunch and you go away, right? You stay, you're loyal. Yeah, that's not how it is. And as much as we all know that, we don't operate against that. So we work with executives all the time and they're not operating with that assumption. They're operating as if, hey, they won't do anything to me. And then when they are let go, they have a network, they haven't set up, you know, they haven't set themselves up for that next at all because they weren't preparing, assuming the company would not do that or at least operating against the assumption the company would take care of them. And it, fundamentally, you have, you're, you have to take care of yourself. All right, company decisions are made rationally. Again, I worked with a CFO, public company. They're spinning off into two companies right now in North Texas. And this is his biggest turmoil which is he just says, we make decisions here that make no sense. They don't make any sense. I he wants things to make sense, and what we found is that they never will. You'll always be frustrated. From a career standpoint, both rational and non-rational thinking are always present and necessary, especially when it comes to career transition, and especially when it comes to finding a new role. I mean, I, I think of two roles we're trying to fill right now, where I interviewed candidates last week. And because they connected well with the hiring manager, he is looking for reasons to hire that person, right? Post-action sense making, looking for those data points to support what he feels he wants to do, right? It's not always rational, even in the hiring process. Uh, career paths are predictable. Um, now I'm talking to a bunch of finance folks, so maybe you're on a path that you thought you'd be in when you started in college. When I ask the question, how many of you are doing roles that you even knew existed in some other technologies and companies, most people don't put up their hands because it's changed so much. And what we found is that most paths are not predictable. Sometimes they're traditional career paths, but often there isn't. And that shouldn't be something that stops you. And then finally, this is an interesting myth that you need to find a career doing what you're good at. Now, what do I mean by that? I know my first job out of college was with Anderson Consulting. Do you have any Anderson Consulting X, you know? Oh, there, there's always one or two in the room. Got to have them here, you know? And it was a good job. It was a great way to enter into the career workforce. And I was called consultant, but really what I was was a PowerPoint guy, right? I was developing PowerPoints for the partners and doing that sort of thing and whatever they told me. I was 20, you know, whatever it was. And then I got pretty good at PowerPoint. So I remember after a year I was doing my partner review and he said, well, we, you're so good at PowerPoint, we want you to keep doing the presentations and being the presentation guru. I'm like, that's the last thing I want to do, right? Time and again, we see people pigeonholed to do what they like, they're, they're good at, not what they love to do. And you got to find a career doing what you love to do. Often, it's a really, really weird trap that you'll get reinforced in roles and assignments doing what you're good at, whether you like it or not. Make sure it's something you love to do. So those are some of the myths and truths that we've found. So foundational beliefs, people and organizations are malleable, right? We've, we tend to look at organizations as these boxes with roles and responsibilities that don't change. They're static until someone up here says that they change. They don't, they move and they morph and they organize around people who take initiative, who are very organized around what they love and what they want to do. And that fundamentally passion and what you love to do, what you're excited about doing is the ultimate organizing force that mobilizes action, activity, and ultimately career success. All right, so I'm gonna go through this um, model, just the first part of it, the inside part of it here, and then talk very briefly about the out, outside kind of band of it here in a sec. But it is what we call the career success model. We've got some books if you want to read about it. We'll even send you a book and we'll give you some uh, information at the end if you're interested in reading more. Um, now, this part, if you could, each, there, on all of your desks is pieces of paper. I believe you have one of the, if everyone could get just one piece of paper. Here, I'll, if you guys could. Your ADA. Um, yes, oh, you betcha. Here, who, who doesn't have paper? Got some of those. There you go. If you don't have paper, let me know. I'll bring it back. Now, if you could do this, Does everyone have some? Oh, yeah, you're the camera guy. But hey, you should do this too. Come on now. <laughs> we won't tell you about it. Yeah, yeah. Unless, unless you measured 50 out of 50 on that career success indicator, <laughs> then you could get up here and teach us how to. If you could do this, just two folds, fold it in half one way, 
and then in half another way, like that. So two folds, and once you folded it in half and in half, break it out like this. And you, what you've got now is quadrants, right? You've got four quadrants. We're going to, if you could, you're going to use a pen and just fill out, and I'll add, kind of walk you through a little bit of work that we're going to do in each one of these quadrants, okay? So as long as you've got that, we're set up to, to make this happen. All right. All right, so what we found is career success, that 3%, we wanted to operationalize how they actually got to this of 49 out of 50 on a consistent basis, uh, these high scores on a consistent basis. And as we walked through the model, we found that they knew themselves, right? And they, at some level or another, have really figured out what their core needs were as a career, from a career standpoint. So we're going to do that quickly here today. The first thing is you've got to identify what you love to do, all right? And what would you do if you had unlimited time, or if limited time, or if money were not an issue? In other words, if you didn't, uh, if you really knew that you had discrete amount of time, or that you didn't have to work because you had full money, how would you use your time? So, in that first upper left hand quadrant, all right. So, if you look up here, this one, I want you to just on your own, take a minute and say, if you had five years to live with perfect health, and then it was done. So May 3rd, 2023, that was your last day on Earth. But, but you got five years, right? And five years of really good health, but then you know that's your last day on Earth. What would you do? How would you spend your time? Just write it down in bullets. What activities, what would you do, get done in those five years? Okay. All right, thank you for that. So. You wrote some stuff down there. My guess is a some of it had to do with family, right? Of course. But other things too. Other things that came to mind immediately are things that you're passionate about. You care enough that you would, on your minimalist time left on earth, would spend time doing. Next question is the upper right hand. Okay, take away. You not, now you're not going to pass away in five years. You've got a long life to live and you've got unlimited wealth. Put a number on it. You've got $80 million free and clear in the bank. Uh, to use however you want, right? Eighty million dollars, all right? And you're gonna live a long life. How would you use your time? What would you do? If you could just write down those bullets. Where did we sign up for that? <laughs> <laughs> if you find it, I'm with you, man. No. Eighty million bucks. Unlimited wealth, free and clear, post-tax, at your disposal and discretion. How would you use your time? What would you do? All right, great. Love this. I love having a bunch of finance people be introspective. This is always a little fun. And I actually see there's letters, not numbers, being written down. So that's, that's kind of cool, too. Um, well, thank you for sticking with me on that. So what we've just done here is that if you had unlimited time and or unlimited wealth, how would you spend your time? What would you do? Those are passionate pursuits and interests of yours. Right? There's going to be some commonality in all your lists, again, around family, etc. And then there's going to be some differences, too. So that is, goes to our next step, which is uncovering your passionate core. Now here's the principle. What we found is that interests we have, whatever they may be, are highly transient. But the needs aren't. Right? So my interest might be, as it has been in the past, I love motorbiking. Right? I love hiking. I love to visit new countries. Now, if you said, Joe, can you make a living doing that? Can you make a living going off and motorbiking, visiting a bunch of countries? And uh, probably not, right? But those are passions that are meeting a specific need that I have for freedom, right? Now, once you know what the need is that's driving those passions, and there could be other ones, then you have a lot of other ways that you can meet that need. So what we're trying to do is get behind that passion and say, what are the needs that you uniquely and specifically have? And, and those career needs, when you uncover them and know them and understand them, and you look backwards, you understand when those needs were being met, I was at 45 out of 50 on the career success indicators. When those needs weren't being met, I was really, really low. And by the way, those needs are very, very different for every person. 
So what we're trying to do is unveil one or two, the one or two core needs that you have that need to be met in your career. And that's what we call passionate course. So to get at those, for each the thing that you love to do, you ask yourself, what does this thing do for me personally? So let me give you an example. Again, what we're trying to get to is this core needs that you have, you specifically have in your career. So these are not, these are real people, although that's not the real picture, but one is a passion for carpentry, writing, and painting, right? Now if you said, hey, go make a living doing uh, carpentry, writing, or painting, when I've been trained as a CFO and finance degree, you might not, that might not be a great career tra transition. But what, looking at that, that was all meeting a core need to create something that lasts. Right? Another one is travel, long walks, and mountain climbing. Right? That person realized that they had a core need, like me, for freedom. That's why I went and started my, you know, my business. Right? I needed freedom. I wasn't happy until I did that. Next one is gardening, volunteer work, and mentoring. She had a core need to nurture and grow things. So each of us have some core needs. They're static. They don't change. How they're expressed and met can change drastically. Right? Now that she knows she likes to nurture and grow things, gardening, volunteer work, mentoring, she can find 10 or 20, 30, 50, and an infinite number of other ways to get that need met once she has that basic understanding of what her core need is, both inside and outside work. So that's really what we're going to do here, is say what is one or two of your core needs within your career. So what I want you to do is look at those two lists that you just created. Five years to live with good health, unlimited wealth, and say what's common on each one of those lists. Okay, now for each one of those, got to ask yourself, and you're going to like try and take a first stab at it, what are the core need or two that are being met by these passions? Think about what are each one of them doing for you personally? I'm going to have you write that down and then kind of share it with a partner here once in a minute or two, but spend a minute or two just writing down what are the core needs? What does each one of those passions do for you personally? What is the need that you have? Uniquely and specifically you. I can tell mine is freedom. Mine is to be in the creation area, not the main maintenance stage of things. And to connect with other people. Have a meaningful impact. Those are my core needs. Yours are probably different. Not right or wrong, just what are they? All right, if you could find a partner, mostly, most three, if there's three at a table, you could talk together. Spend a few minutes just kind of processing it with them. You've done some written work here. What are your common passions? What do you think your core needs are? And bounce it back and forth with each other. Just talk it through, if you could. Just grab a partner just next to you and go through that process. All right. Um, boy, I feel bad stopping this, man. You guys are engaged. It's always fun to, to talk about this stuff. It really is. Um, the, here's Anyone want to share, you know, what did they learn? Anyone, what is... Kind of share a core need. What are some core needs that you guys isolated or, or surfaced through this? I, as I walked through, I saw some written down, but who would like to share a core need or two? Yeah. Well, we both like, kind of, we really like travel. Traveling with, like, and that goes along with freedom and independence. But also, for, for, for me, it's like, it's really not like travel because you, it's like learning outside of a classroom. You yep. learn the local custom, history, economy, and you go to a European country or whatever. So yep. that was, a, it was funny when he said that, yeah, that's, those are two things that jumped out at me as well. Yeah, interesting. So those are core needs. It's like to learn and some level of independence, freedom. Yep. Uh, just expanding on that a little. You, you just said a word, learning, lifetime learning. Yeah. You have a huge need for that to, to keep learning and. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Well, one of the things for me was to make sure I honor God in everything that I do. Uh, I'm Good. passionate about so many different things, and we tend to compartmentalize our lives. And I think what I hear you talking about there, there, the whole idea of work-life balance is work-life integration. Yes. That is, I hope, for example, to get my wife into working with me and have her leave her corporate role. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just about helping families uh, build wealth and respect it. So. Well, and, and so knowing your needs, I have a need to learn and stretch. I can't be in roles where there's not learning, stretch, and growth. I can't be in roles that don't have meaning 
beyond the role itself is what I hear you saying, right? I have a need for some sort of exploration and independence and freedom. For me, my own story, I, my last real job was a head of HR for a large publicly traded healthcare system before I got in, did my own thing, this was years ago. And I, young executive, big role, and I hated it. Absolutely hated it. And, and I didn't know why, right? And when I realize now what I didn't like was it was not one of my needs was being met. There was no freedom, it was constrained, it was routine versus growth. I mean, it was all the things that other people lusted and wanted, I didn't, right? And where I realize is we are wired differently. In fact, our own assessment of executives, we not only look at cognitive abilities and personality characteristics and emotional stability, we look at their level of commitment and what they really need in their career. And we found that's a huge predictor, so, right. Any other core needs that you identified through this process? Yes, sir. Connection. Um, family connection, friend connection, but also Good. connection at work. A better job would be to be connected to your coworkers better, both above the low end and stuff. Yeah. Great one. And, and some people, they, they want independence so much that they won't want connection. You need connection. When that was being met, you enjoyed your career a lot more and your job a lot more. I guarantee it. I'm not it. sure how I could work at home. I'm not going to work at home. I don't know. I'm, I'm more of a, I, I like to be around that clock. Yeah, and you need that it's a meaningful connection. Yeah, one of my daughters is the same way. It's not only I need people, I need to connect. I need to get to know them. They need to know me at a deep level. That's just what she needs. It's a core need. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to say something similarly. Uh, which is the need to socialize. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So be out there, be with other people, yep. you know, whether it's in a group setting or, you know, if it's one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And you could, you know that, right? And that informs what you'll do from a career standpoint. Any others? Yep. You need to create something, to build something, to have, you know, build a legacy that kind of will kind of you know, go beyond That's your need right there. Excellent. Any others? Really good. Thank you very much for sharing those. That is what you have to be true to. What are those core needs that you've found energy through different passions, but those core needs really need to be met in your career? That is what we want to get to. Because obviously, when you know what those core needs are, not the passions themselves or the interests of the activities, but the core needs that they're fulfilling, once you know those core needs, you have a lot of different options from a career standpoint how you can get those met. And you got to be true to those. All right, I'm going to go through the rest of this because we're running out of time, I'm sure. But just at an intellectual level, um, certainly then we can answer any questions you have. And then, you know, I think we're going to give out a few of our books. And I'll tell you, if uh, we're going to offer up to send you a free book of Don't Dread Monday. If, uh, we'll give you our contact information here at the end. If you just email us, we'll, we'll send it to you. We just need your address. Uh, the next piece as far as getting the Career Foundation is identify a role that fits and then fundamentally declaring it. What we found is that you can't hide it in the closet. It's amazing how much you mobilize other people's resources when you, you're real committed to what you love to do, what you need to do, the role that you want, and then you bring other people in because you're excited and how much they really become your advocates. So that's, that's another piece that we found that 3% does very, very well within careers. Finally, career navigation, uh, more in the book. And again, we'll give it to you. But there's six practices we found in career navigation. First of all, shape your role. Organizations are more malleable than we think. You can shape a role, define a role, build a role, wherever you choose to operate. You know, whatever that looks like. And we give a lot of examples in the book of doing that. Be the players. Fundamentally, anywhere you are, whether you're independent, small company, large company, there's two to four people whose opinion of you, whose support of you, will make or break what you're able to do in your career. And we go in a great deal of exploratory, who are those people, what we call the players, and how do you become a solution for them so that they advocate for you? Don't tell them what you want, become a solution for them. And we walk through a process, really important practice, to jump in the shoes of the people you're trying to influence and know who the key stakeholders are to do so. So get equipped fundamentally to align with your core needs, what do you need to learn to do. Network, network, network. Know the road rules. Know the road rules is fundamentally the culture. Now, culture is this ambiguous, kind of ethereal, opaque thing that we talk about. It's real. It's true in every company you go to, there's a different culture. But how do you navigate it and manage it in such a way that it helps you in your career? What we found is there's really two questions you need to ask yourself that make a huge difference as far as you being able to navigate your career and get your needs met. One is, in this company culture, 
what will get me hung and what will make me a hero. Simple. It's important to know that. Now you can make decisions to get hung, but you're making that decision, right? What will get me hung and what will make me a hero? And that is often different in different companies. So making sure that you know that. Finally, check in. What we find is that people will really align, uncover their core needs, align with it, organize their work around it, be true to it, and then once in a while they find that their score is going down and down and down with the career success indicator because they're getting allured by other things. Make sure you check in and align with your core needs on a regular basis. So that's kind of the process. I'm going to stop there because I think our time's about up. We're pretty close. Any questions as we go through uh, th this process that we went through pretty quickly? Any questions, comments, or otherwise? Yes, sir. So I'm sure I know this is this gets to be multitasking and so forth. But in your comment about check-in, do you recommend that you take that survey, uh, that indicator, and as you change either your age or your employer or whatever, and then retake it and then kind of maybe plot? I know I'm getting kind of anal. Oh, but no, I love it. Hand, maybe it tells you I'm getting closer to the 41 to 50 or you know, I'm still not oh, I think in the right direction. 100%. I think it's great to take it yourself and have your employees take it if they're willing to share their results. You know, and, it, and what I've found is when I send it, I, when I have my employees take this and I say, if you're comfortable, share with me your score and what's going on here. All of a sudden, I'm asking them not about performance, but about them and their happiness, their engagement, their satisfaction, how they're doing. And I'm because I want you, it's a win-win, I want you to be fully engaged, but I gotta make sure that I know where the gap is and what needs aren't being met. So it's absolutely good for an individual check-in and a check-in with those meaningful people in your work environment. Um, and more and more as my kids, I, we got five kids, my oldest is finishing college here, and I'll get into the work, work world. I'm gonna have her take this, right? And I'm going to make sure that she's checking in and, and understanding her core needs and how she's doing at any given time. It's free. It's actually out on our website. So you can go and take it on online version, send it to whoever you want, and they can complete it online also. And it's just a nice pulse check. Uh, it's funny, my wife, Marianne, I'll, I'll speak for her, and I, she might slap me after, but I'm used to that. But uh, she, it's funny, she was actually, uh, before we worked together years ago, took this with her department. I think the average score is like 16 out of 50, something like that, which just, you know, one person was zero out of 50. I mean, when you, it, it's a good red flag when you see people are low on this, because it's affecting their health, their sense of well-being, so many other aspects of their life other than what happens at work. So I, Dan, long-winded answer. I would encourage you to take the career success indicator regularly, share it with those that you love, care about, in your work environment, and have them do a pulse check on a regular basis too. Does that make sense? Any other questions, comments, show tunes, anything like that? All right. If we, um, if you are interested in, we've got a few books here. If you're interested in us sending you a book, we'd love to do that. We really would. We look forward to just, you know, at no cost. Just email me, Joe F, at Career MP. You also have our cards, I believe. On the table, grab it, just email.